What if I told you that a serial killer was outsmarted by a 15-year-old girl? Shocking, isn't it? A young girl decides to spend the day at her best friend's place, and in a wild turn of events, she's kidnapped and in the hands of a dangerous man. This is the story of Kara Robinson. It was June 24th, 2002, and Kara Robinson was at her best friend's house in Columbia, South Carolina. She had planned to spend most of the day there. As the girls thought about what to do for the day, they decided to take a walk to a nearby lake. Kara's friend decided to check with her mother first to see if there was anything around the house that they could do before they left for the lake. Her mother simply asked her to water the flowers in front of the house. Kara offered to do it for her. Her mama said, y'all can go to the lake, but I need you to do da-da-da-da. One of the things she wanted Heather to do was water the flowers. While Kara watered the flowers, she saw a green Trans Am Firebird drive out of the area. Kara didn't recognize the car, and it was a little peculiar when the car returned and pulled into the driveway just beside her. A man came out of the car and greeted her warmly. At the time, an innocent Kara was not aware of who he was. He told her he was looking to sell some magazines, and he asked her if her parents were home, as if suggesting he wanted to sell them. An unsuspecting Kara simply replied they were not. This was her first mistake. He then asked if she would like to take a look at the magazines. As he leaned in to give her the magazines, her instincts knew that something was not right. Within seconds, things turned bad. And as he was leaning in, I felt a red flag somewhere in my head. He had brought out a gun and pressed it into the side of her neck, threatening to shoot her if she screamed. Kara started to realize she was in trouble. She had to follow his every command, one misstep, and he could end her life. I think I felt a moment of terror. I knew I just needed to do what he told me to do. He led her back to his car in broad daylight and ordered her to get into a large plastic storage container that was in his back seat. It took up the whole back seat. He said, get in the container. Kara was terrified, but wondered how her body would even fit inside, but she needed to follow his orders to have any chance of surviving. She managed to enter the container one leg at a time. When she had fit her body fully into the container, he put the lid back on top, got into the car, and he drove out of the neighborhood. He loosely set the lid on top. He got in the car. He reversed out of the driveway. How did no one see this? Where was Kara's friend? As he drove, Kara paid as much attention as possible to each turn and stop that he made. Considering she was quite familiar with the area, this could be useful to her if she got a chance to run. I thought he was going to assault me and that my life could possibly be at risk. He drove on the freeway for a while before she felt him pull over on the side of the road. He opened the plastic container and told her he was going to tie and gag her. He took the lid off of the container and he told me that he was going to restrain me. Like most other kidnappers, he was trying to establish a sense of control here, letting her know he was in charge. Kara went along with everything he said in fear of losing her life. He tied her up and put her back into the plastic container. It took a few more minutes for him to arrive at his destination, an apartment he was sharing with his wife. He dragged the plastic container with Kara inside, up the driveway into his house. He picked the container up, and then I felt him drag the container across concrete. Once he was inside, he removed the lid of the container. One thing Kara did was that she made sure to study every detail of the house. Although this didn't guarantee her survival, it at least gave her a chance to escape if the opportunity arose. While she was tied up, he asked her many questions about herself and her life and he was writing her answers as if this were an actual interview. He started asking me questions and writing down the answers. Following up on her initial instincts, she tried her best to learn a lot about him, trying to make him trust her and maybe let his guard down. She gathered details about his past military service, pet lizards, and fish in the house. As much as she held out of the thought of eventually escaping, she had a feeling she might not escape and come out of there alive, especially if he were to sexually assault her. It was, it was very real for me in that moment that I may never get to see them again. She had a feeling this kidnapper would be no different from the horror story she had been hearing in the news about bad guys, so she did everything possible to keep herself calm. While he sexually assaulted her, she kept her eyes closed and she tried to turn her brain numb and think of anything but what was happening to her, just to cope with what he was doing to her. While I was being assaulted, it felt like something that happened to someone else. I kind of shut off my brain and left my body. As time went on, Kara kept collecting as much information about her captor as she could. She knew that such information would come in handy if he was ever complacent enough to give her a chance to escape. About eight hours into her captivity, he turned on the TV to see if her kidnapping had made it to the local news. There was nothing on the news about Kara Robinson. 
He started to play with her head, telling her that no one missed her since her abduction was not reported to the local news. He then made a surprising comment and promised to let her go and even allow her to report it to the police, but had convinced her that she would forever be labeled as another girl who got raped. A few hours later, he put her back into the plastic container because he had to call his wife Hope, who had gone on vacation to Disney World with his mother. For the evening, he drugged her with a cocktail of Valium and marijuana and restrained her to the bed with some handcuffs and tied one of her legs to a corner of the bed, and that he then slept beside her that night. When it was morning, Kara woke up with her captor still asleep. She knew the time had come for her to try and make her escape. She was able to get out of her restraints quickly, but quietly without waking him up. She then got up from the bed trying not to make any noise, grabbed her clothes, and made her way to the living room. She dashed out of the front barefoot and towards the street and saw a passing car and was able to wave them down. She told them she just escaped from a kidnapper and to drive her to the police station. She made sure to point out the apartment she escaped from to them since she didn't know where she was and so she wouldn't forget herself. When she arrived at the Richland County Sheriff's Department, she was able to speak to a deputy, although for most of the conversation, she felt like the deputy didn't believe her story, which really frustrated her. As Kara was presenting her story to me about what had happened the night before, as a father, I wanted to hit the table. They decided to take her to the hospital to get evaluated and checked out. On the way, the deputies decided to drive back to her captor's house. However, his house became hard to find since all units looked so similar on the block. While driving around the complex, the deputy stopped a property manager driving a golf cart and after, they gave him some details of the apartment that Kara shared. The manager knew exactly which house and easily directed them to the right unit. When they got there, he had already fled. It was at this point they found out his name, Richard Mark Evidence. The deputies moved fast and obtained a search warrant for his apartment. There, they found an old newspaper article about how two sisters, Kristen and Katie Lisk, had been kidnapped and murdered. The police then reached out to his sister to see if she could help them to which she said she knew where he was hiding, nearby at a motel. The sister told me that he was in a Ford Escort at that time. We learned the Ford Escort belonged to his wife. However, when the police arrived, it turned out they were a few steps behind and he was already gone again. Although it seemed like evidence was successful in evading the police, Kara Robinson's first-hand account of smart thinking and attention to detail during her abduction would eventually pay off. The police started looking for his green Trans Am, it didn't take long for the police to pull him over on a highway in Sarasota, Florida. As he realized that the police found him and were closing in on him, Evidence took his own life with a gunshot to the head. Kara Robinson was relieved he was gone and no longer able to hurt her or anyone else, but she was looking forward to having her day in court with him. Because of Kara's brave actions that day, subsequent investigations by the police linked Evidence to the kidnapping and murder of three other young girls, 16-year-old Sophia Silva in September of 1996 and Kristen and Katie Lisk in May of 1997. Evidence's involvement in both crimes was confirmed by DNA testing. Although Evidence didn't get to face the law, at least his victims' families can take comfort in the fact that he is no longer alive.